and has lots of application in terms of finding clusters in all dimensions, in high dimensions. The problem is, if you try to apply this to the three-dimensional space data, the end of the problem I pointed out at the very beginning. So at this stage, I have no mechanism to tell me how to differentiate dimensions. Okay? I have not have a mechanism to different dimensions from one to another. So I treat all the dimensions equally. Okay. If you treat all dimensions equally, you're really trying to measure the closeness of a point in all dimensions. So here you have to measure the distance in three-dimensional space. If you do the three-dimensional Euclidean distance, then you will end up to have uh, one cluster here, one cluster here, one cluster here. Okay. You can also claim there's no cluster. Of course, for you, many of you doing region, uh, region, of course, uh, identification, of course, you know you can use this also connected. This is a one dimension. That's that's a different story. Okay. So I already mentioned that. Here we designed this data set. Many of the data set have these features. It's really on when you project this data set onto appropriate subspaces, you will be able to identify patterns embedded in the subspaces. It's the so-called projective clustering. Okay. And the problem is really how to automatically identify dimensions which are relevant for clusters. So you have to identify the dimensions and identify the clusters and determine the clustering criteria all simultaneously in parallel. Okay? So it turns out that the key to solve this issue is really try before you do the clustering, you do the comparison first. Okay? So we Many years ago, we started by saying, OK, so what do we do is we imagine there is comparison layer, it's hidden layer of neurons, where you compare the input signal imposed on this to remember the top down way is telling you the statistic feature of that cluster. So if you have input signal, you compare with the corresponding statistical mean in that particular dimension. If that dimension, that signal in that particular dimension is close to the statistical mean or statistic feature in that dimension, then allow the signal to be transmitted. Otherwise, you don't allow the signal to be transmitted. This is called the uh, 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 uh dimension specific signal processing, the SOS. And of course, the neuroscientists are telling me there's no such a thing. We don't have any hidden neurons in our central nervous system. And it turns out that um, in working with the uh, neuroscientists from the University of Chicago, we are now both moved to New York and California, there are some new neurophysiology in the last 10 years to identify this phenomena. So, what is phenomena is something to do with something you always hate, the so-called delay. Okay? So you just compare the signal input onto the input sensor neurons and compare with the statistic feature that's the top-down weight and compare the similarity. If it's similar, the signal is processing faster. Otherwise, you intentionally slow down the transmission. Well, we do that all the time. We do the computing, that's always you do, right? You try to adjust the transmission speed, task priority, so that some tasks are going to be performed in any particular time, so you can do multitask. This is exactly what you do. Of course, what is important is not just single transmission delay, but in other sense, really so-called signal transmission loss. In the past, we always believed signal transmission is always northeast transmission in our central nervous system. But if the signal transmission is delayed, then the signal is getting weakened and weakened. Okay. Now, if I put everything together, so I have a input neural, cluster neural, synaptic connections, and signal transmission delay, and delay induced signal transmission noise, then I get a, uh, something that uh, I always like. It's a multi-layer uh, uh, dynamical systems with adaptive delay. So 
I will go through this equation very quickly. So you have one layer of neural is the, the uh, input layer of neurons, so it's driven by the input signal. The second layer is competitive network of clustering neurons with the weighted sum is the uh, input signal to that particular neural. And this is how you calculate the weighted sum. Now the weighted sum is weighted of the output signal from the cluster, from the input neurons, but decayed when the DNA is getting large. And then the next is tell you how you adjust the DNA. Again, the DNA is just by whether your input signal is similar to the statistic feature. And then you try to modify the synaptic weights, both the bottom up and top down. That's related to naming. Remember this unsupervised clustering. Okay, so this will give you a larger scale system of DNA differential equations, and uh, uh, this whole mathematics tell you exactly uh, this system. That's exactly what you expect it to do. So it automatically select the winner and identify particular dimensions which are relevant to this cluster. And once you go through the whole data set input to this machine, it will also recover or discover the clustering criteria. Okay, so I don't want to go into detail. So uh, here's example. Uh, huh. I don't think you believe the high dimensional. So the uh, illustrative example for dimensional data. They form clusters in different subspaces. The first data set form the cluster in the first two dimensions, and the second one form the cluster in the second and the third dimension. Those dimensions are not necessarily different. Okay, so you have one dimension, for example, sharing, and the data set are formed in different subspaces. So there is an algorithm based on this neural network architecture allow you to detect subspace clustering. And of course, you can do uh, spreading the same data set in many different ways, in, in many layers. So there's something relevant to deep learning. So once you have a data set, you try to see, try to differentiate all the data until we eventually find all different data belong to different clusters. You can stop anywhere in the process. But the key is really to allow you to find the no dimension subspaces where you are able to find the patterns. Okay, so I mentioned the three examples at the very beginning. So those are the examples uh, we have found applications, and uh, there are a number of uh, applications, uh, including I say the gene, uh, gene, uh, gene expression data analysis, text mining. Uh, stock association related to time series clustering. Uh, what we are really looking forward uh, to working with you guys to find more uh, engineering applications, especially the larger value of uh, moving objects uh, in three dimensional spaces. So one of my students, Yang Ying, is going to talk about something to do with the uh, online ecosystem. So how really do the matching between supply the display of ads and the clickers on the ads and how to find the patterns from the digital fingerprinter of your clicking to identify patterns of clickers so you can display your advertisement in an optimal way. And another way of doing this is to find the, uh, the cluster of, uh, of diseases prevalent at any particular time from the online, on, from the uh, over-the-counter uh, drugs. So there are different drugs pick up from the over-the-counter. You can digitize all the data. And from the drugs to pick up, you would be able to, hopefully, you can able to, you are able to identify particular clusters of patients. And in that particular case, the garbage collector is more important because that really tell you uh, which disease is emerging. So this is something uh, detecting clusters uh, simultaneously detected outlier. All right, so I think I should stop here. I know we're competing with the lunch. Thank you. Good another talk. That's another talk. Yeah. I wonder, you know, we, we are seeing now deep learning, like a deep neural network. 
Right, right. And we were excited at the right. avoiding Heisman and all the other people. Right. And now we look at competing because all the different architects are how we build the logo. Right. Yeah. Is it getting different types of formats for us? Yes, it's, it's, well, technology is trying to talk about big data, high dimension data, try to develop. Uh, technologies collect all the data, develop all the high, high uh, to, to build all the high dimension data sets. And the problem is the high the dimension, the less information you can get for you making decision. So, so you have okay, all this gene expression data is particular, for example, thousands of genes, you detect, develop technology, collect as much information from all those genes, but then it's only one of the genes important for you to make a decision. And so the rich information creates tremendous challenge for you to find the knowledge, uh, for you to act on. So I, I changed all of my presentation during my hearing from Brand and from James. We found the moving objects and projected the only small segment of information is of importance for particular users. So identify those particular patterns embedded in a small segment of the data in particular subspace is, I think, is, is a challenge. Well, as, as a mathematician, I have one question. You know, recently we published a paper from Nature kind of building a very useful way of project planning. The thing is, they just included adding a one dot. Right. This is the number one. Right. And one over the way. Uh -huh. And suddenly it makes the all neural network make a dot. And, but the thing is, we couldn't understand what's going on in the dot. Right. Industry-wise, a little bit hesitated because it's, it's industry-wide. It means engineer-wide. Well, <laughs> so really, engineer really want to know what. They the, understand yeah. what's going on. How it's fixed. Right. So well, it depends. The that's that's why. So there is announcement about the uh, IBM Watson uh, is now considered a big failure by other companies. The mm -hmm. Texas uh, Anderson Hospital has terminated its agreement with uh, collaboration with Watson because. Exactly what it's saying to collect all the patient data and to find the useful information that uh, for them to be for the hospital to use those information to really want to understand what is really going inside until they know that those information is still not something actionable by the medical association. So uh, yes, so that's corresponding to recover this through the neural network. You really want to go back to see what is network. Structure, and um, so, so I know the Houston Health Center hired some statistics and try to find the network structure from all this uh, between input and the output. Any more questions? I'm not so familiar with this subject, so maybe it's a stupid question. But um, could you take uh, the variance of a dimension into account uh, and, and therefore knowing how much information a certain dimension is explaining in the clustering uh, problem? Yes, that's, uh, that's the uh, uh, another one way of doing that. The problem is there are infinite many dimensions. And if you think of n-dimension data, if they are n-dimension, they are highly, they are all independent variables. Okay, so the cluster can be fo formed in one dimension, in two dimension subspaces, among n-dimension subspaces. Uh, the choice of sub n-dimension space, the choice of n subspace is a, what's called hard uh, MT program. So the computational uh, intensity uh, is huge, especially you want to find the coherence uh, for different subspaces. So uh, not to mention that this group of data is formed not in with respect to any x or y directions, but is really along this so-called principal component analysis. So those dimensions really change all the time. So I didn't talk about this part. This is how to combine this with principal component analysis. And intrinsic, 
difficulty here is every time you have to compute the covariance of different variables, it's, it's a huge task. So when you when you uh, want to find your patterns, do you, at the very end do you end up finding parameters that model those patterns? Yes, those parameters are corresponding to uh, some of the parameters are something you tune. So naming rate, for example, is really remember I want to build a machine, so I really want to uh, in can increase my uh, naming rate and so forth. Those are uh, system parameters, but there are other parameters related to synaptic weight. For example, uh, statistic features, those are adaptive. Every time you input the data, you mm -hmm. complete a naming process, I mean, clustering process, you have to update those weights. Those are also parameters when the machine is built. Yes, so mm -hmm. there are lots of, uh, but the good thing with the neural network is you identify this class, this parameter that's the same automatically. And would you look at the correlations between the parameters too? To I look at the correlation of the variables. When you input the data, you have variables. We are oh, working, okay. for example, with a, a data mining company to identify from this statistic data uh, of particular chronic disease diabetes, for example, to identify the behaviors, the consume behaviors, the social economic uh, activities, including the health behavior. To particular disease, then so you have to identify the correlation. But uh, again, identify the correlation of variables is a huge challenge because really every time when you have a huge data set, you have to do the principal component analysis uh, of the high dimension data. And uh, again, you have to you have to do this globally because you want to input all the data sequentially, but until the sequential input is complete, you won't be able to design this brain.